Good morning. I'm going to turn Walt off. There we go. I did. I did. Are we recording, ladies? All right. So good morning and welcome to the Deerfield Community Church. Uh, my name is Tim Griffin and, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here this morning. The Deerfield Community Church is an open and affirming community and that means no matter who you are or where you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So I was not with you last week, but I understood we got through it. Technology, we, we got through it all and I even saw the recording and it looked good, sounded good and it's great to know that Suzanne and I can be away on a Sunday. <laughs> Um, just a couple of brief announcements. Um, there is a pile of stuff in the great room that was donated for the donation tables for the um, craft fair, and it needs to go upstairs. So if there are folks available after worship, if you, if you could just go, many hands make light work, I think is the phrase, um, stop in the great room, grab something, take it upstairs. Dee will tell you right where she wants it to go. Um, I just put you in charge of that, Dee, because you asked me to make the announcement. <laughs> um, and then that can probably be done in like one trip if, you know, we get it all up there and out of the way for the rest of the craft fair to get set up and uh, go from there. Um, decorating for Christmas. Woo! I'm, I am super excited about this because last year, like, Jackie Nyberg and I were the only two in this building at Christmas, and we were doing all of the, just the two of us, and that was a lot. And we didn't have a tree, and we had a big monster piece of metal going down the middle of the sanctuary with lights shining out the windows, and it was pretty ugly in here. So I'm excited this year that we're going to be decorating for Christmas in this room. Knock on wood. Um, thank you. Always can count on Bo. Uh, so... 8 a.m. Saturday the 27th. 8 a.m. Saturday the 27th. That is the day, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Um, that's when the tree's gonna go up, the lights are gonna go up, the garlands and the candles and all of that stuff. Um, and then Marion is gonna let us know about when we are going to then decorate the tree. So if you're kids, um, it won't be that day, uh, but we will probably, did we, did we get that or are we gonna wait? All right, so the, the current thought <clears throat> is the 28th, right after worship, that we'll decorate the tree um, with the kids, and, uh, but we need to confirm that and see if we're going to interfere with Sunday school or make it Sunday school. So there's, there's our ideas. Um, an update from here about COVID. Um, you're going to hear this weekly right now, that the... Um, Rep Council made a decision a few weeks ago that if the percent positivity rate is under 4%, we would go with masks optional and we would have coffee hour. If the percent positivity rate is between 4 and 10%, masks are required and there is no coffee hour. And that is for Sunday worship in this room and while you're in this building, unless you're like in another breakout. So if you are part of the um, 3G 101, that small group in that small room can make a decision as to what they want to do. But in this larger gathering where we are welcoming all, we wear masks if we're in this state. If we go above 10%, we're going to be back to remote via Zoom until we drop below 10%. For reference, today, Rockingham County is at 8.3. Hillsborough County, where Bo lives, no? All right. Well, here's the Hillsborough County is at 9.7. So the numbers are creeping up in New Hampshire. We need to do some praying around that, I'm sure. Um, but just that's, that's how serious it is. We were, we were just below six a week ago. Um, so the numbers are kind of spiking up, and we just need to be cognizant of that. And, and unless you are in a 12-foot away up here at the pulpit, this has to be on and we're worn correctly if possible in the sanctuary. Enough lecture. <laughs> yeah. 
And I think, Suzanne. You've got five seconds, four, three, two, one, no. For nominating committee, I just want to say thank you to everyone that we have reached out to. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback, so thank you in advance. We still have just a few openings left, so we'll continue to buzz around and ask to see if you prayerfully would like to take a position. Thank you. Whew. That was good. Hmm. Yes. Oh, she's. Cindy gave me a piece of paper even, and I forgot. Uh, if you have not already done so, there is a book study that will go along with Advent. You should have a slip of paper or received a slip of paper. Uh, you can check a box whether you want to go Sunday after church, Tuesday evening at someone else's house, other evening, etc. Basically, survey. Uh, take this. There are boxes at the doors. Door. To, to pop that in so they can figure out what they want to do moving forward with the book study. It's, it should have, it, I think it was handed out, right, this? Last week. Okay. So they're by the basket as well. You can take the piece of paper right there and fill it out. All right. Oh. There you go. Sandy's got the right idea. Let's inhale deeply and exhale gently and welcome the light of Christ among us this morning. And would you stand as you are able and join Walt and the ladies and myself in hymn number 28, For the Beauty of the Earth, it will be projected and is also number 28 in your hymnal. For the beauty of the earth, for the... Over and around us lies God to all to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the wonder of each hour of the day and of the night hill and hell and tree and flower morning's responsive call to worship. Let our heart, hearts exalt in the Lord. Our strength is exalted in God. Let our mouths be ever fixed in praise. God has given us the victory. There is no holy one like our Lord. There is no rock like our God. Praise the Lord. Please be seated.
we now come to the time in our worship service when we give ourselves an opportunity to raise up to God our prayers of concern and celebration, those things that we have on our hearts and our minds um, that we wish to raise up in God's sanctuary amidst God's people. I have a few this morning, and then we'll open it up for others um, to also offer their prayers. Um, so, uh, Tim Griffin uh, raises up prayers of thanksgiving for the students at Concord High School who had to undergo uh, TB tests because there was a positive uh, TB test at Concord High School, and those tests have gone well, and as far as I know, that kind of scare is over, yes? Yes, they have yeah. to be retested on December 15th, but so far, no additional infection. Excellent, excellent. Uh, prayers, uh, Bonnie Heisey, I spoke to her this week, and I know many of you are probably aware of this as well, at the Deerfield Community School has, um, I think, 42 cases of COVID right now, and there are several families who are also awaiting test results as well. Um, their closure on Friday, uh, this is not to minimize the, the positive test results, but I think their closing on Friday was to give students and staff an opportunity to breathe because Thursday was a holiday. They had over 100 students out on Wednesday. So, so it was like Friday, it's like, let's just take Friday off, give the community an opportunity to breathe, and literally and figuratively, right, and see what happens um, on Monday. I don't know if they're, they're open tomorrow, but please continue to. They are. They are. Thank you, Tim. Uh, please uh, pray for this community, our community, um, and our children, and our sta the staff that are teaching our children uh, in the school here. Likewise, um, please continue to pray for the residents and the staff of the Inn of Deerfield. Um, they also have, who have been spared uh, all of the issues dealing with COVID since March of 2020, um, had started testing positive, I think, two or three weeks ago. And that has affected multiple residents, and there was, was one resident who also passed away. So. Please pray for the, the residents and staff of the Inn at Deerfield as well. And I, I'm looking down at my prayers and it's like COVID, COVID, COVID here. And I just, uh, this was raised up on Tuesday in the Zoom to prayer session as well. Just prayers for all of us as individuals and families and as a church uh, to continue to just make good decisions. Um, whatever that decision is. Uh, and that whatever decision we make for ourselves as individuals, if we decide that there's a particular Sunday that we don't feel comfortable coming to church, that's okay. There's no judgment here about that. Not only is there no judgment thanks to this church and the work that you've done prior to me getting here, um, we have the technology to be able to allow people to do that. And is it the same as worshiping in the sanctuary? No, it's not. Of course it's not. It's not the same as being together. We all know that. But it's a wonderful, wonderful alternative. And I would say that given the numbers that we have here in Rockingham County and, and the surrounding counties, because there are some people that go to this church that don't live in Deerfield, right? Uh, there are many people that the decisions that the leadership of this church have made regarding I think Diane, I'm sorry to keep calling Diane out, but she said it so succinctly. She said, we should do everything that we possibly can to assure that we can remain worshiping in person. And, and at this point, that means mandatory mass and no coffee hour, regardless of whether you smell coffee. <laughs> I'm serious about that. The reason for that is because we see, you see, that Deerfield is being affected by this damned persistent virus in a way that we have not been affected in two years. It's frustrating, right? It derives anxiety in us and stress and anger and wanting to return to things the way they used to be. I wanted to do it now. I'm there too. 
I feel that. And I smell it. Right? Not yet. Not yet. Because we're about to enter into this time of thanksgiving. This, for the church, ecclesiastically, this time of renewal and rebirth. This time of Advent. And we all know what Advent is. It's a time of waiting. It's a time of waiting. And if the numbers here in Deerfield go above 10, it would be tragic if we couldn't meet. And I will tell you that we are one of only a very few handful of UCC churches, especially progressive churches in the mainline Protestant tradition that are meeting. That's our decision. We get to make that as a congregational church. But please, please keep each other safe. Make good decisions, not just for yourself, but for your neighbors as well. That's the golden rule. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me when I drone on sometimes. Jenny Hutchins requests prayers for her mom, Shirley, who is actually scheduled to have her hip surgery this week. So that's good. <laughs> Jenny's on. Yes, two thumbs up from Jenny. That's good. Yep. So Thank you for all for prayers. Surgery, so please, prayers for her and for her medical staff um, as she seeks to walk without pain, which is a wonderful thing. Those are the prayer requests that I have. Are there any others? How are you doing over there, Tim? Good. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, all right. My man. Thanks. It's not on. Um, I just want to put my friend Nancy in prayer. She has pneumonia and COVID, and she's in the hospital, and she's confused. And I hope that the Lord comforts her however he may. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers about the shot. It seems to work. Yay. Yay, good. Prayers for my neighbors, Hilda and Dean Haight, who are moving um, to Clarksville during the middle of this week. Um, uh, pray for God's speed for them and improved health and happiness. Hilda is having her last chemo therapy this week. Um, they have been my neighbors for 41 years mm. and will be um, missed beyond words, but wish them well and they're new. They're excited to go. Mm -hmm. I'd like prayers for my friend Val Allen, who was in a terrible, terrible automobile accident on Tuesday night, has multiple broken bones, mm. an elderly woman, and I just pray for her recovery. And also prayers for our son Ethan, who is having back issues. For, for who? Ethan. Ethan. Back issues? Thank you. Prayers for Don that he can remain patient. He was okayed for knee surgery, but Yay. he is yet. <laughs> Continue prayers for Joe Dumieski and uh, prayers for all veterans. Yes. Continued prayers for Michael, who has been moved out of isolation ICU into regular ICU. And this is. COVID pneumonia related. Prayers for all the pharmacists that are trying to not only fill prescriptions, but also give vaccines to um, booster shots as well as to our youth. Yes. Amen. I ran into that a little bit, a bit of that this week myself. So thank you for raising that up. Yes. A prayer of celebration. On my way to church this morning, behind the town hall, there looks suspicious like a skating rink in the making. <laughs> so such 
Enjoy. Safe outdoor winter recreation. It brings such gladness. Yes. Yes. Just a prayer of joy that I got my booster shot this week and I didn't get sick. Yay. I want to put my son Jacob in prayer because he has gone to a chiropractor and it's the first time he's seen a doctor. Amen. I'd like to add a uh, just a prayer for those that are going through transitions, having to make difficult decisions and life changes, etc. That they be at peace with that and, yes. and have God by their side. Yes. Anyone on Zoom? Hearing no other prayers and seeing no other prayers. Let's pray together. Maybe. All right. God, in your mercy, you hear our cries and know the hidden desires of our hearts. You answer prayer. We come to you, gracious Lord, praying for ourselves and our community. We pray for the witness of the church that we might live the gospel. We pray for the global community that we might learn from each other and live in peace. We pray for the needs in our local community. For we know that you, O oh God, are our provider. We pray for those who suffer in mind, in body, or spirit. Make us agents of your healing power. We remember those who have died. Help us to comfort those who grieve. We lift up to you the silent prayers we hold in our hearts and our minds that are too deep for words. We ask all these things for the glory and honor of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Morning. So I've got some good news and some good news this morning. So how often does that happen, huh? So the, the, my first good news is that our annual giving campaign this year, we've received 43 pledges of your financial support of Deerfield Community Church next year. And I think that's great. I think that's really good news. Um, that's 43 signs, I think, of just how important this church is to you and to me and all the things that we do here, whether it's worship together or all the other activities that everybody's involved in, um, it just is a good sign that that's how important that all is. So to each of the 43 of you, uh, thank you, really. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, oh, and by the way, those 40, 43 pledges total one, $138,825. So, so my other uh, my other good news is that based on 
past years, like last year, year before, um, we still, we think we have about 20 folks or 20-ish, 20 or more um, folks that haven't had a chance to pledge yet. So um, if you folks can, can reach out and get your pledges in, we have a good chance, we think, of making our $175,000 goal uh, for this year. So I encourage you to, um, to please pledge. Um, there are cards, I think, by all the drop-off boxes. It's easier yet if you just email Carol Tordoff, uh, dctord at gmail.com, um, or you can go online at uh, uh, dearchurch.org and, and pledge that way. Um, but please do. If you've already pledged and said, oh crap, I didn't pledge enough, then do it again. It's okay, and we will, you know, we'll, we'll go more. Uh, but please do, and thanks very much for all those that have so far. Thanks. Hello. I'm out of practice. Um, this is taken from today's daily word, which happened to be prosperity. The divine idea of prosperity is unlimited, more than sufficient to meet every need. I know true prosperity when I live from this truth. As I give of myself, I increase the flow of prosperity in my life and in my world. This morning's offering will be given and received. Feels like they've lost it all Over the edge With no one there to break their fall And what do you say to someone Who feels so unloved Giving themselves away a little bit every day Just to be good enough What do you say to a hopeless soul can remember their way home and everything is out of their control. There is no valley, there is no darkness, there is no sorrow greater than the grace of Jesus. There is no Jesus, there is 
Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's not printed here. <laughs> Dear God, we offer these gifts back to you. Multiply them that they might help build up your kingdom on earth. All glory, praise, and honor are due to you now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll invite all of our children and young at heart forward this morning for our children's circle. And we have a pinch hitter this morning. Our own Jess is gonna fill in for Jennifer this morning. And we will sing, Jesus loves the little children. We didn't rehearse that, did we, Paul? No. But let's just pick a key. You, you go ahead. I'll, I'll pick it. How about uh, That's good. Jesus, yeah, there we go. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Shape and size, they are precious in his eyes. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jess. Hi. Hi, Hi Jess. So, who knows what the word perseverance means? You know what perseverance means? What do you think? Anyone? Perseverance. Stick to itness. Yes. A bunch of support. Yeah, if you're like trying to learn a new thing, right? Well, I looked up the definition this morning. So perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficulties, failure, opposition, or delay in achieving success. So I was thinking about my younger son who kept trying over and over and over and over to make a basketball team. And he had a trainer and he kept trying again and again and again, but he never made the varsity team at school. And now he's playing intramural. So he kept trying over and over and over, but that never took away from his desire 
to keep trying? Can you think of something that maybe you have learned or taught yourself by trying over and over? Thank you. Thank you, because I had brought up with your pastor today about tying shoes and pastor said, well, no, we all learn to tie our shoes eventually. So like we, we all get there. But I remember too, I remember sitting with my dad for hours trying to figure out how to tie my shoe and we figured it out, right? Or we got Velcro, right? Right, right? With a little, you know, by the time you have kid two, you do Velcro. Well, we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear a Bible story today about a woman named Hannah. And Hannah used great perseverance in her relationship with God. And she didn't turn away when she was met with people making fun of her and being difficult to her, opposing her difficulty. So I would just encourage you to think about perseverance and we'll think about um, and sticking to it, right? And not being daunted when the world tells us that we can't do it or we shouldn't do it or it's too hard to learn to do. It's having that faith, right? To keep practicing and keep trying and keep trying. All right? All right, let's pray. All right. Dear God, thank you for being with us when we try new things. Give us the courage and the support to continue to persevere, whether that's in learning something new, whether that's in loving everybody around us, and loving ourselves and loving you. And thank you for being with us as we persevere. Amen. Amen. You got one? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. This is a reading from 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow, O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child. Then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, 
Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This ends our reading from 1 Samuel. This morning's second lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his faith, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's pray together. Almighty God, speak your word to us and guide our feet that we might be hearers and doers of your word. Amen. This morning's sermon will be the last one uh, in this sermon series on sanctuary. And had I uh, heard this from Robbie Robertson prior to coming to church, I would have preached a very different sermon because apparently there's a commercial, thank you for this, Robbie, there's a commercial out there in the world that basically says, if you buy this brand new BMW station wagon, you'll be taken to sanctuary. And Robbie, Robbie said to me this morning, well, I have an answer to all of our prayers is we just have to purchase 80 new BMWs for every member of the congregation. So, so ahead of time, proactively, I just want to say congratulations on your brand new BMW station wagon. I'm not sure when you'll get it, but you know, this sermon is about perseverance. So, so there you go. Thank you for that, Robbie. So in this last, uh, sermon, uh, last sermon on sanctuary, uh, I want us, uh, I'm going to attempt to try to get us to focus on how God, and by extension God's people, might be a sanctuary for the frustrated and the mournful and the anxious and depressed and the sorrowful. In other words, for all of us. Because no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey or what state your heart or head is in, by faith, we are reminded that when things get real for us in this life, we can get real with God. 
This portion of the story of, of Hannah we heard this morning is the story of a woman who bears her soul to God in, time, in a time of great trouble. It's the story of an older woman who for years has longed for a child and remains without one. And daily she travels to the temple to pray to God on her way, and on her way she is ridiculed. And this goes on year after year and day after day, and even from her own husband, who I'm sure means well, as most husbands do when they approach their wife who, who are struggling with infertility. Basically, it's trying to support her, but is basically thinking that she's... Um, well, weeping for no reason. Why are you weeping? Why are you crying? Why are you upset? Well, he doesn't seem to be so supportive, but at least he's there, right? So daily she travels to the temple to pray to God. She is ridiculed, but she continues to remain in conversation with God. In prayer, she continuously voices her longings, her hopes, her fears, and her joys. And within the context of the times and culture Hannah lives in, her worth, like most women uh, of, of her day, was measured by her ability to produce a child. And in that patriarchal system, if her husband dies, she's unprotected. Without a child, she would be considered useless. And it must have been a horrifically anxious state for her to be in, to not have a child, and to be aging. Yet she perseveres in her faith. Let's put some context, a little further context to this story. This is not a story about faith. This is important. I want you to hear this. This is not a story about faith solving all problems. It's not a story that teaches us that if we pray harder, try harder, put on the armor of God, pray the right way, attend church more often, get right with God, that all things are going to be made well. We all know that that's not true. And that kind of thinking has been responsible in this story and in other stories in the Bible. That kind of thinking has been responsible for wounding a countless number of women throughout history and in our churches who have struggled with fertility issues. Yet it is a story about faith. Hannah's struggles to conceive, uh, Hannah's struggles to conceive go on for years within the context of a family that is pretty messed up. Her husband's not very understanding and his other wife continually harasses her. And this goes on for years, yet Hannah continues to worship and pray. Political strife a global virus that seems to not want to quit, coming closer and closer within our community, affecting the local school and the nursing home. We argue and complain about our inability to have life be as we want it to be without really giving much thought to protecting every member of our community. We live within a society that seems to raise up power and privilege and prestige, while the powerless, the persecuted, and the poor are treated unequally and as less than. And within this current state, to whom or where do we turn to prepare us for the long and difficult journey of discovering and developing a deep faith? What is it that enables us to endure, to persevere, to gain the courage and the conviction to keep moving forward with God, even in those times when all we want to do is blame God? rather than turn to God. There was a woman friend of mine. We went to seminary together. I didn't get her permission to talk about her in her sermon, so you're not going to hear her name. But it's a good story. She was born a PK, pastor's kid. The first couple of decades of her life were not easy. She railed against authority, her parents, and religion. She got involved in some bad habits and bad relationships. She was hospitalized a few times for the sake of her mental health. She loved music and learned how to play the piano. She eventually went on to learn the piano very well. The songs she wrote 
were dark and foreboding. They engaged God in her questions, her frustrations, her anger, and messy emotions through the music. She always believed in God, and she continued to pray to God. Her spoken prayers, like her prayerful musical com compositions, were focused on, why me? Why me? And she kept praying and praying, and she persevered, and she got real with God in some of those prayers. What is up with you? What is wrong with you, God? And she eventually came to the realization that no matter her state of mind or her heart, God would not leave her alone. God was always there, listening, weeping with her, laughing with her, holding her when she didn't feel very huggable, loving her when she didn't think anybody could. She came to recognize at last, for at least a glimpse, she came to recognize her inner worth, her preciousness, regardless of life's discouragers and discouragements. And years later, she would head to seminary. It took her many, many years to graduate. One class at a time, two classes at a time, commuting for hours. I remember I was, I remember I confessed myself sitting with her at the cafeteria one night and saying to her, you are much more faithful than I am because I had to move to seminary to go to seminary. I couldn't commute for two hours each way. I couldn't sleep in a small dorm room that was built in the 1950s and hadn't been updated for since then. She persevered. She was faithful. Hours and hours on the road, nights in a not so modern commuter dorm room, sleeping on people's couches. These things and this time for her was exhausting, but she did it. She found a church after she graduated that fell in love with her and she with them. And they have been partnering with God and God's people for years now. When Hannah is praying to God, she prays a prayer of lamentation, a prayer for help in a time of trouble. She doesn't know what the future holds, but she comes away from her time in prayer with a deep and abiding faith that no matter what happens, she's not alone. God's got her back. Even if her husband, extended family, and surrounding community do not. I think it is true for us. When we pray, if we're honest with ourselves, when we pray and we remain in community and in communion and in relationship with God, we don't always know what the future will hold. We have our desires, we have our wants, we have our needs, our petitions, if you will. We raise them up to God in the hopes that things, that those prayers will be answered in the way that we want them to be answered. But the truth is, we don't know the future. It's a safe bet that the future will include for all of us both joy and sorrow. And that's just real. That's just life. However, in God, through the story of Hannah, we can rest assured that whatever the future holds, we know who holds the future. It reminds me of a hymn, right? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Right. Life is worth living just because we know he lives. As we enter into this time of Thanksgiving and Advent, this time of rebirth, right? Advent, Lent, Christmas, Easter, lots and lots and lots of common themes, birth and rebirth, life giving and life everlasting. When we come to this time of liturgical and ecclesiastical newness, 
We're on the cusp, only two weeks away. Get your shopping done, folks. Don't rely on shipping either. Shop locally, come to the fair next week. Thank you for the commercial break. God is with us. And not only in times of celebration and joy, but in times of worry and stress. And as we approach this time of year, let us begin, as we begin to hear the story anew, let us remember the miraculous story of how it is that God chose to come to us as one of us. And how did God do that? Through the marginalized, the downtrodden, the weak, the lowly, the humble, the nobodies. The nobodies and the poor. That's how God chose to come to us. If you listen carefully to Hannah's complete story, you might recognize her prayer, her second prayer, which is in the second reading. It didn't get included this morning, but I invite you to read it. Continue to read the story of Hannah, and you will hear a prayer that sounds vaguely familiar that we will hear in a few weeks, probably three or four weeks, and that is her own Magnificat. The whole, the, her own story, Hebrew scripture story of how the world is turned upside down because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of God's love, because of God's countenance and providence. Let us remember that it's okay for us to get real with God, to ask the hard questions, to voice our worries and our concerns and know that in the end, whatever end might come, a new beginning awaits just on the other side of the end. Amen. Would you stand as you are able and join us in singing our closing hymn it is number 423 great is your faithfulness Is your 
your faithfulness, praise your faithfulness. Morning by morning, all mercies I see. I am needed, your hand has won my day. Great is your faithfulness, God unto me. Siblings in Christ, may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And we invite all children and church school teachers and class pals to make their way up to church school. And a reminder for 3G1 participants, we'll meet very shortly in the parlor.